Hi everyone. Um, welcome to Playful Leadership. Just, what I'd like to do is invite us to um, stand up. And the thing is, you do as much or as little as you like. So if you want to stay seated, you can. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand and I invite you to join me. So I'm just going to mute. Okay. It's all good. Okay. Okay, so when you're ready, follow me, because as we know, a leader knows when to follow and a follower knows when to lead. So let's just do a little bit of a warm up. Set your feet hip width apart. Yeah. And uh, let's just start with our hands to so stick your arms out in the air and just slowly rotate your wrists one way. You know, if you want to turn your screen off, you can, but it's so much more fun when it's on, you know, and the other way. Our bodies love symmetry and one scientist has proposed that's because there's so much uncertainty in the universe that when things are symmetrical, we kind of feel a little bit calmer about existence. Okay, so let's do some shoulder rolls as well. So just bring your shoulders up to your knees and roll them one way, either forward or backward as you wish. Just a couple of times. Sit and then another way. Typing shoulders these days, isn't it? Okay. And then we'll do some hip rolls as well, because I guess we don't get as many nights out, <laughs> unless it's like this um, these days. So I know some of us might be doing that outdoors, which is lovely. Okay, so when you're ready, um, follow me. And actually, you know what? Go ahead and just unmute yourselves. Let's just challenge Zoom a little bit, if you wish, okay? You're, you're welcome to play, okay? So when you're ready, follow me. One, two, three. Heads and toes. and toes. and toes. and toes. He's in toes. Much faster. Are we ready? Just go. No. One, two, three, go. Heads, shoulders, toes. Heads, shoulders, knees, and toes. Heads, knees, and toes. Heads, shoulders, knees, and toes. Heads, and toes. Heads, and toes. Heads, shoulders, knees, and toes. Heads, shoulders, and toes. Heads, shoulders, and toes. Poor Steve's in an office. <laughs> I've got, yeah, I wish my last colleague wasn't there. <laughs> I think he's jealous, actually. <laughs> Wait, it... Steve's wife must be delighted by how much uh, play he's had already in this uh, talk, hopefully. Excellent. So it's lovely to meet you all. Um, welcome to Playful Leadership, the Art and Science of Emotions. So, how are you doing? How do you feel after that exercise? Just go ahead and unmute yourself to share. A nice cozy group. You yeah, a bit, a bit more alive after my long day at work. Oh, lovely. Thank mm. you. Well, yeah. a bit more alive. I, I just put my hoodie on because I was feeling a bit cold. I've now taken it off. <laughs> <laughs> Warm, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. What else? Yeah. Well, I have to say, heavily pregnant, bending down that long way. It used to be easy. It's now a bit harder. So. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good work, Claire. Good work. <laughs> I've been uh, embarrassingly out of breath. Not, <laughs> <laughs> does it? Surprisingly. <laughs> I recently trained as a children's yoga teacher, and after half an hour, I'm like, I've had a workout, which is incredible, isn't it? It really doesn't take a lot um, to get us moving. So I'm going to jump right in. I'd like to share with you uh, a different way of thinking about emotions. Um, emotions, uh, from a yoga perspective, many yogis see emotion as E hyphen motion, as an energy in motion, as you would expect. And once we realize, actually, 
you don't have to get so emotional about emotions. It's simply energy in motion. You might be thinking about GCSE physics or something like that. It becomes a much more tangible and perhaps approachable thing. But also emotions um, in some tribes around the world um, is actually considered to be the what happens uh, in interactions between two people. So emotion is what happens when two people come together. And when I came across um, this, uh, the research um, from Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, it was very interesting because, you know, they needn't be a big deal. Uh, it's something that we can manage. And even in some tribes, they don't have the notion of emotions uh, as we do. And perhaps that makes it um, simpler for us to understand each other. So here's a model called the effective circumplex. Circumplex des uh, describes the shape that I'm about to show you. And affect um, is basically a simple emotion. So let's step through it. According to the affective circumplex, fancy name, is uh, along the horizontal axis is a feeling of pleasantness. And then along the horizontal axis is energy. So how pleasant was that sing song for you and how energizing was it and how much did it take, right? So it turns out um, they've taken the time, Barrett and Russell in, in 1998, to really map out um, the relationships between these um, emotions. So we're gonna go start at 12 o'clock and actually work backwards, okay? From high pleasantness to no pleasantness and high energy and low energy. Okay, so if you were in the top left quadrant, high energy and it was low pleasant, then you'd feel tense. But if we were to reduce that, it'd be nervous, maybe stressed, maybe upset. And then we move into sad if it's low energy, depressed, lethargic, fatigued. But as we move over to the right-hand side of the diagram, here's where it gets really interesting, right? Because low energy um, and uh, high pleasantness or just medium pleasantness is actually calm. And most of us enjoyed this, it turns out. We want to be kind of low energy. I guess it's like a lizard, isn't it? Sunning itself on a rock. And just, you know, it's average pleasant is fine. We continue around the circle. So you move on to relax, serene, um, contented, happy, elated, enthusiastic, excited, and excited. Now, what's really interesting um, about this diagram is actually the relationships of the opposites of the emotions. So for example, if you look at enthusiastic, the dotted line, the opposite of that, if you like, is lethargic, right? Nervous would be relaxed. And it kind of shows you that actually, um, we'll talk a little bit more into the, the research that goes into emotions and the latest findings, but actually what might, you know, make one person feel nervous um, might make another person feel relaxed. And in fact, if you look at sort of around the 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock, you know, that boundary between tense and excited is really quite skinny, isn't it? Because for some people, they might be very excited about Christmas, but for others of us who may not enjoy the, the Christmas eggnog so much or what happens after that they might be really tense about the same event and this is the important thing to recognize that we all respond differently uh, to different stimuli but ultimately as we'll learn um, we can determine um, how we respond to that that was just a kind of quick taster of what tonight's about my name is Portia. I'm the founder of the School of Play. I'm an executive coach, an executive agile coach and a play researcher. And uh, I've been doing this for many years now. And one of the sayings I've come up with is to play once a day to keep the doctor and the priest away. And that essentially means to stay healthy and alive and well. And I think play has um, really been put to the test during this period. And certainly amongst my friends, you know, They've developed hobbies they never imagined possible, and they've somehow found time and energy to do that, which in turn recharges them. And I also wrote a choose your own adventure kind of book, like a fighting fantasy, if you like, um, called The Dream Team Nightmare. Well, so if you fancy having a read of that, then you might enjoy that too. So without a goal, it's hard to score. And I've taken the liberty to create us um, a user story for tonight. So the title is Emotional Intelligence. 
As a leader, I need to develop my emotional intelligence so that I can lead, live, and love wholeheartedly. And by leader here, I mean every single one of us, not just leader by title at work, because at the end of the day, we're ultimately responsible for managing and leading our own lives. So if all goes well, then you'll be able to raise your hands and we'll tick off the success criteria. First one, I understand how emotions are made. Second one, I have a greater awareness of my current level of emotional intelligence. Thirdly, I have at least two ideas to develop my emotional intelligence. And fourthly, I think the most important, I've had fun. So hopefully we're close to maybe ticking that off already. So when I put this talk um, together for the first time, it was a year ago actually, um, and it was for Agi Next. I'd been on a silence course where I spent four and a half days mostly in silence with 49 adult strangers. And it was a very curious experience because it was a precursor to the first lockdown in England. Um, and as, as I reflected on my own emotional journey um, through my play research, I said to my then seven-year-old, I said, I, Emma, I just don't get it. You know, I decided to take up play research because I was looking for light, love and laughter. And instead where it's taken me is darkness and sadness and tears. And I'm feeling a bit glum and, you know, maybe this is not the way to go. And she looks at me non-judgmental of course because that's children they look at us with love she listens attentively and then she goes sadness and i went sadness and we played a few rounds like this because of course that's the way how play works right we issue an invitation someone receives it and then that gets the play cycle going and after a few turns i realized you know what the light, love and laughter was there all along. It was just in the middle amidst all that darkness and sadness and tears. It was always there. And it's, it reminds me of, um, you know, that Disney film, Inside Out, you know, that the idea that sadness um, would not exist without joy and joy that had been so fearful of sadness wouldn't exist without sadness. And it's just recognizing that, you know, all these things, um, exists as a greater whole. So I welcome you today to kind of like a frozen director's cut version of this. Um, it's only suitable for 18 year olds and above, but that's only because younger children already know this stuff. So for this evening, uh, we have three golden rules, uh, which I would invite you to observe. The fir what, first one is to treat everything as data. So there's no need to judge it. Uh, second one is to stay with not knowing. That might be novel for some of us but also quite relaxing. And the third one is to simply trust in the process, this journey that we're gonna go on. So what is playful leadership? Um, I've taken liberty to really kind of tighten the definition because people like to know, don't they? Um, well, it's a leadership approach, which combines a, a multitude of things, but more specifically play science, psychology, neuroscience, and coaching techniques to enable transformational change at both an individual and group level, that is both fun and enjoyable. Yes, transformational change can be fun and enjoyable. It does not need to be full of suffering and uh, torture and drama. So I, again, that might be unusual, but that's what I found works. And this is a picture of me um, at one of my clients recently where I started a ukulele club, a lunchtime club where we played in the lobby sort of once every week or fortnight. And <laughs> ended up sort of gathering fans and people would ask us to play songs for them and it was just ever so uplifting and it's amazing how we can create change um, through relationships in that way. Now playful leadership is also um, the idea a bit like playmaking in football which is you know leadership that facilitates the flow of value through vision skills control and most important of all the leader's ability to play. And you know, play can mean many things for us here. And today's focus really is very much about the role of emotions within play. So that's kind of where um, I'm gonna leave it. So given where we're gonna start is the best places here, I'd like you to um, either grab a piece of paper and a pencil if you wish, or just do this in your head. So step through the 13 statements I'm happy to share the PDF, Carl already has it after. 
Just step through each of these 13 statements and then give it one of the numbers. One is definitely false, two is mostly false, three is mostly true, and four is definitely true. Yeah. So I'll just go through the statements in case people are just listening to this um, audio. Okay, so the possible answers are one is definitely false, two, mostly false, three, mostly true, and four, definitely true. So number one, I am fit and healthy. Number two, I am calm and confident. Number three, I am logical and rational. Number four, I think for myself. <clears throat> Pardon me. Number five, I am resourceful. Number six, I communicate effectively. Number seven, I work well with others. Number eight, I get the support I need from others. Number nine, I feel joy. And number 10, empathize with others. Now, if you've seen the play index before, uh, version 1.0 kind of ended there, and this is a real special treat. So here in Brighton, I hope you appreciate this because you're kind of the first people to see the first three latest statements that I've now added to the index based on my research. So the 11th one is, I acknowledge things as they are. Number 12, I feel comfortable in my own skin. And number 13, I feel I belong in the world. Just raise your hand so I can see where you're at if you've um, managed to complete the, the list. Um, I thought, I, these ones, oh, I love the background. Reminds us that we're all together. Lovely. Oh, and hello, Emmanuel. Lovely. Hello, everyone. Okay. Now, at this point, people might say, oh, Portia, what exactly are your play research credentials? This, this thing you put in front of us, it has nothing to do with play. Well, shall we see? I came up with this index um, in large part inspired by a piece of work called Play Develops Children in Four Ways by the Strong Museum in New York. And they describe play as developing children in terms of physical development, yeah. cognitive development, which includes independent thinking, by the way, social development, yeah. which includes things like conflict resolution. I mean, you know, that's a great amount of work for children to do, isn't it? And fourthly, emotional development, which ranges from self-regulation to impulse control. And that's where, um, if you would call it a model, where the model ends. And that's how I developed the 10 statements initially. And the key thing with play is that it's unique to each individual because how we play depends on what we enjoy, what we were brought up with, um, and ultimately the environment we're in now. So for example, Sudoku might be someone's delight and yet someone else's nightmare, right? Warhammer, another person's delight, but another person's tragedy, you know? And it just depends how we play and it's unique to each of us. So the statements in the play index actually indicate outcomes. What happens when you play enough for you? So I've since extended it because what I'm finding is whilst all the statements here all these aspects are relevant to children growing, the, there needs to be a little bit more so that the model works for all human beings. Um, so I've added this piece in the middle, which kind of ties it all up together beautifully, I feel. And of course, that is systemic development. You know, when we play enough, we are centered or grounded. You know, we, we live life with ease. Can you imagine that? Living life and going to work with ease. And of course, belonging, because that's really a fundamental need um, in creatures like ourselves, where we live in tribes, of course. And this isolation um, that has been imposed on us during COVID um, is especially challenging because of that. So we can't really talk about emotional intelligence without mentioning Daniel Goleman's great work. So here's another exercise. What Daniel Goleman has done, of course, is to split um, in 
in motion intelligence into kind of two categories the self and then being with others the social relational and there here you can see kind of the the four categories in the top left we have self-awareness yeah including self-motivation and confidence and an accurate self-assessment of who you are and how you feel um and then also on the self side is the management self-management you know are you able to stay optimistic are you able to rebalance yourself behave in a way that's transparent with your emotions and then out in the, the wider world, the outer world that we interact with is the social awareness, such as empathy um, and being in service of others. And then there's the relationship management, which is, um, you know, like inspirational leadership and change catalyst and teamwork and collaboration. Now, I'd like to invite you to um, number each of those quadrants based on um, the one you feel are your greatest strengths to the least. So one would be your greatest strength and fourth would be the least strong one out of these four. So go ahead and just have a go at doing that. And at any point, if you want to interact via chat as well, you're welcome to, I've got my eye on that. Okay, but we're welcome just to share if you wish. So when you're done, um, go ahead and raise your hand so I can see you're good to go. Okay, just take your time. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Steve. Lovely. Thank you, Brian. Lovely. There's no need to overthink it. Um, you know, just go for the first number and uh, we'll see how we go from there. So what I find is that um, when we do this exercise and also with the um, clients I come across who I coach, there is a tendency to rate, you know, how we interact with others, the social awareness, the empathy is the first one, uh, our, our greatest strength. And then the second one might be, you know, relationship management, developing others, etc. cetera, uh, followed by self-management and um, last but not least, self-awareness. So it kind of goes like this in the order of strengths, where one is the highest and four is the least strong. Well, this is the funny thing. So if we look at what Daniel Goleman says and what a lot of other work that goes on in terms of human psychology, um, you know, where our strength, our power comes from really begins with ourselves. So unless we have that self-awareness and unless we are able to manage ourselves emotionally, um, you know, the one and twos we give ourselves, we're probably limiting our potential in that way. So what if we were to flip it around and really focus on self-awareness and management and then move outwards um, in order to have that growth? And, you know, for me, I've been sort of doing agile and change and then more recently um, individual and team coaching specifically outside of agile as well in addition to, is that, you know, leadership begins with ourselves. And I think unless, unless we have personal leadership um, down pat and really, you know, continuously focused and improving on that, um, it's really very hard to lead from um, a centered place. So let's take a deep breath in. Hmm. So how do you feel now? Who'd like to share? How do you feel now? Quite relaxed. Okay. Who else? Interested and engaged. Conrad, interested and engaged. Engaged was the word I was going to use as well. Ah, yeah, curious. Okay. And so this is the thing, right? There's no need to judge how we feel against other people. And the other thing that you can also play with, I'm gonna ask you how you feel a few times because it's just about finding where it is in your body and just getting a sense of what curious feels like to you, right? Is that you can't judge how you feel by looking at somebody or even by their body language. 
That's what the latest research shows, right? And I think that might be a really kind of drop the mic moment for a lot of people because a lot of the entanglements and miscommunications is often from, you know, mind reading other people. And the fact is you can't do that. And I'll share more about the, the science behind that um, in a short moment. So in one of the more desperate moments in my career as an agile coach, um, I inevitably read this book because as a change agent, it's not always easy because if it were, they wouldn't need to hire us, right? Um, so I read uh, Man's Search for Meaning um, by Victor Frankl, who was a psychotherapist um, and a psychiatrist who um, ended up um, being imprisoned multiple times and escaped multiple times during the Holocaust and he survived. Um, and his family and um, I believe he was the only one and it's one of the most moving books um, on the subject of the Holocaust and I would strongly um, recommend it and at this desperate time in my career when I was thinking really you know this change cannot possibly happen in this place where I am where human rights seems like to be a fundamental issue you know and I think you know this book kind of gave me hope because Viktor Frankl through his experiences, right, his life experiences, observed that between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies a growth in our freedom. And for me, this was a little bit like a story when I came across it. Um, but I held it in my heart and mind and I thought, okay, okay, you know, Victor Frankl is definitely someone worth listening to. And as I did a little bit more digging, you know, thanks to the kind of sciences we have now, it turns out that there is this space and it's a hundredth of a, of, a milli, um, of a millisecond, I think is one estimate, hundredth of a millisecond, that space between stimulus and response. And when I found that out, I was like, bonza the fact that there is that sliver of a time, I can use that, you know? And some of you may already be thinking if you practice mindfulness and meditation, you could like get better return on investment of that sliver of time, make it seem elongated if you are able to kind of slow things down and catch your emotions in time before you, you know, um, do a rude sign because someone's just cut you up on the way to the school run or anything like that, right? Really just control your chimp or your inner lizard or whatever it is you call it, or, or friend the amygdala. So what I find is with all this theory, it's really important to apply it during the learning of it because A, it makes it more sticky and B, hopefully it'll be more useful. So what is change? Well, change is a verb and a noun. So there's action and it's not just an event. Um, it's about making or becoming different. And it's an act, event or process through which someone becomes different. And so it's ongoing, right? Now there are fundamentally two types of change as far as I, I'm aware. There's the superficial change like a haircut or a new house or a new car or a new phone or a new gadget, right? And then there's the kind of deeper transformational change that may last for a month, six months, who knows, maybe a lifetime, right? But it really requires us to dig deep. So what I'd like you to maybe um, play with now is just have a little think to yourself. What challenging step do you want to take right now in your life that you are not taking? So just have a think about that. What challenging step do you want to take right now in your life that you are not taking? So just take a deep breath in and really find where those emotions associated with that challenging step is in your person. There's no need to judge it, but maybe just try to sense it. Mm -hmm. and just hold hold that thought for yourselves and we'll come back so knowing where it is perhaps in your person and if you can you know just give your left brain a little rest and let the rest of you take over what's just on your own have a think about what's between you 
and feeling fine about this challenge. What's between you and feeling fine about this challenge? Simply just note it in your mind. It, it may not even be verbal. It could be just a feeling, it could be an image. Maybe a little bit of uh, a sped up heart rate or just warmer fingertips. Just notice that. What's between you and feeling fine? And what this will do is help you calibrate when you get into situations like this again. So you recognize it. So five or six years ago, um, I became a bit disillusioned about this kind of whole agile transformation thing because um, I found that it wasn't often that uh, my efforts would endure. They might succeed for a period of time, but ultimately organizations um, are living things and the, the good work and the hard work would um, be turned over uh, with new managers and leaders um, and inevitable change. And then all that good work would seem like a waste. So before throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater, it's given that agile coach was my job title. I thought, okay, maybe it's time I have a look at this, this coaching bit of my job title and explore that a little bit. Um, and it was a very curious experience. And actually um, a lot of what I share today is the result of the emotional journey that I undertook as a result of doing um, this. And of course, this is the lovely piece of paper you get for that hard work. Um, and the experience is this, the most memorable emotional discovery, me, uh, discovery for me happened on day two of the first module. There was about, I think, 15 of us. We were all strangers. Day two, module one. And we were asked um, in trio, so there was an observer and then two others, and we would take turns. One would be the coach and one would be the client. Um, and we would be asked this question, um, what does being a coach mean to you? What does being a coach mean to you? And you wouldn't have thought that'd be, you know, uh, a particularly uh, unusual question to be asked on this course. But before I knew it, when I was asked this question, I burst into tears. And inevitably, of course, um, the people around me were kind of probably a mix of horrified, terrified, didn't know how to help kind of thing. Um, but you know what? The funniest thing was this. The moment I um, had that emotional outburst, as quickly as it appeared, my mind cleared. It was like the heavy, dark clouds you see um, on a kind of gray day. And once you've had the massive downpour before you could even get your umbrellas out, you know, the clouds are parted and there's your rainbow. And the clarity of thinking I had from that in single emotional unexpected outburst um, helped me realize so many things that, you know, here I was now um, in this uh, situation where I, I, you know, self-funded this coaching course because I believed it was something I needed to do next in my life. And um, here's the kind of mount of self, uh, self work I'm going to have to climb, you know, a bit like climb like Mount Everest. I'm going to have to climb this. It's not going to be easy, but at least I've got 15 or 14 other people to, to climb up with me maybe, or at least <laughs> they might be just in base camp because they don't need to climb the mountain. Um, and I just suddenly felt so resourceful and grateful um, because I remembered at that moment that growing up, um, I developed a, a reputation or been labeled by my family of origin as a bit of a crier. And I thought, okay, well, you know, here's my chance at the ripe old age of 41 as a birthday present to myself to finally maybe explore this Achilles heel. And here's the more curious thing, because as the course went on, um, whenever I got coached, as the client, when I was being coached, there would be many more emotional outbursts like this. And every time it was like a baby step towards something else, towards a new version of me. And it might have been a tiny, tiny upgrade and not point, not, not, not one <laughs> version upgrade. But I could feel something shifting in me 
um, like you would get in those kind of transformer toys or some, you know, magnificent domino uh, puzzle you're setting up. And the other thing was this, what I call the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde phenomenon, because when I was the coach, people commented at the stillness I had, to which they were, of course, very surprised. <laughs> um, and whenever I coached, I took it very seriously. I was present because it was important to be there for the client, right? It's a matter of life and death of growth, right? Um, and the feeling of coaching when I was coaching was a mind spa, a mind spa, you know? And it got me thinking, how can it be so different? You know, it, it wasn't a spectrum. It really was a difference between heaven and earth or black and white. And I really wanted to understand that a little better for myself. And one of the things that um, I came to really experience is this uh, idea. This idea is um, from Neuro Linguistic Programming, NLP. And all I've done is simply given it a name because it had no name. And I call it the self-sufficiency principle. It's that everyone has everything they need to overcome the challenges they face. Everyone has everything they need to overcome the challenges they face. And when we actually embody this principle in the way we interact with others, and most importantly, when we hold up that mirror and interact with ourselves, something magical happens, right? And we've seen this for those of us who manage people successfully, for those of us who have a loving and strong bond with our children, even when they're much older, they still come and visit us. You know, that's how you know that you've essentially, you know, applied this principle because you've enabled people to think and be themselves. So this is one of the key things that enabled me to continue with my emotional discovery. And here are the three key things that people didn't really tell me about. Um, that I had to kind of conclude myself and of course did a reading, do a lot of reading about. And of course that's because emotions are taboo, right? People are afraid of it and that's why, you know, they'd rather you go dark like Elsa and just run to the hills and never come back. Go and cry in your room. I don't want you to look at you when you cry. You know, when we go to playgrounds, we only need to be there for a few moments and we'll see a child fall over. They'll start crying because they've injured themselves. And all too often, a parent might then say to the child, stop crying, it's nothing to cry about. Go over there, and when you stop crying, then you can come back over here to play with us. Right, and this is why I feel that it's so important to share what I call the Emotions 101. So we, know, we, now, we now know through, um, you know, neuroscience, that the human brain experiences emotions before logic and reason. The human brain experiences emotions before logic and reason, yeah? It's not physiologically for us human beings to do otherwise. So if someone, a colleague of yours, for whatever reasons you felt upset, um, and they say to you, well, you know, what, you know, what are you squirting some for, you know? But why can't you be more like Spock? You can now tell them, you know, with respect that Spock was half Vulcan and half human. And therefore he may have had the capacity to perhaps experience and, you know, um, life stimuli from both outside and inside with logic and reason first. But humans don't do that. Humans experience emotions first, okay? The second point is that crying is one of the body's natural responses for removing pain and toxins. And I learned this from Nancy Klein, um, uh, one of the coaches who came up with this idea of a thinking environment, where if we listen to people for long enough and ask them the appropriate open questions to ignite their independent thinking, then people will do the most exquisite thinking and actually, you know, overcome the challenges they face themselves. Right. But again, that is a very rare find, you know, rarely are we encouraged to, you know, go through that cycle. And through this emotional outburst, it could be crying, it could be anger, it could be, you know, any one of those, an emotional outburst. Emotions are actually a way for the mind to get intelligence back. And when I started reading this about Nancy's research, 
I remembered that as a child, um, when I'd be upset about something because I knew it was not okay to cry like that in my childhood home. And that's not uncommon, by the way. Um, I kind of figured out, okay, well, I'll do it somewhere else. So whenever I felt, you know, upset in, in a way that I couldn't take to someone else, I'd go to my room and have a little bit of a cry, feel better because the, rain, the rainbow would appear. And then I go back downstairs again. So already, you know, children um, and adults who are in touch with their bodies still, we call it the felt sense, um, know what's good for them. And this is where play and emotions are so important because if you do what feels good for you, then that is usually good for everybody else around you, right? So knowing that feeling our emotions enables us to get our intelligence back is a big deal. And of course, to really grow and become a person is about being effective um, and comfortable with feelings, right? And um, the uh, psychologists and psychiatrists have been very kind in the way they've uh, helped us express this, right? Carl Rogers, um, who worked with children a lot, he describes intense emotions as loosenings, right? So like I said, it doesn't have to be crying. It could be some form of emotional outburst. And it actually could indicate a person's transition from one developmental stage to the next, right? Now, isn't that interesting that actually, you know, on becoming a person, you do evolve in stages, no different from the way that um, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And here I wanted just to show you briefly a glimpse of these seven stages of development by Carl Rogers, right? And in stages one and two and three, we'll see that they're you know, defensive against change, um, unable to even talk about themselves, let alone feel what they feel, yeah? And whilst we may be able to do that with comfort, perhaps with our families, we may not be able to do that so easily, right? Express ourselves fully at work. And it's not until you get into stage four, according to Carl Rogers, that you're able to begin to talk about deep feelings. Yeah. And then in stage five to really express them. Can you imagine expressing emotions is a stage five? You know, it's a big deal. It influences your decision making. It puts you in touch with yourself. So you no longer need a second opinion. Of course, it's great to get feedback. But you know what? If it's a life decision and it concerns you only, then you lead yourself, right? And of course, that enables you to accept and take responsibility for your actions. And then it goes on to stage six and seven, where you know, you're know you able to show this thing called unconditional positive regard. So this loving way of treating a fellow human being, um, not just the way you want to be treated, but the way they need to be treated. Yeah. So it's really sort of deep stuff. And along the way, I discovered another inspiring quote uh, from another uh, expert in this field, Eric Fromm. And to par paraphrase what he says, you know, a person's purpose is to give birth to themselves. And, you know, and when I saw this quote, I thought, well, yeah, like, I get that. You know, it's every bit as messy and it explains <laughs> all the noise and the smells and the trauma that comes with this, you know, because uh, it wasn't easy bringing my little girl into this world. There's all of us who've been in the delivery room of one of our, our greatest um, gifts would know this, right? It's not easy, especially to give birth to ourselves. So let's do a round. How do you feel right now? Who'd like to share? Claire. I'm ensconced in the learning. I'm wrapped around it. Mm. What, whereabouts this ensconced? Whereabouts, Brian? Uh, in my brain, um, I'm feeling a bit, a bit foggy, but that that's the hay fever. But um, I realised I was virtually in the screen, and I was like, "Hang on, hang on," and I <laughs> just step back from it. Thank you. Um, may I invite you just to take a deep breath in? I know it's hard with your hay fever. Maybe breathe through your mouth so that helps. Just take a deep breath in. Yeah, and if you can breathe into your belly, so you know, make your belly expand like a ball. Because if when we were the P 
pure breath like that in and out, it actually clears up to 70% of your body's toxins. And just see if you can drop into how your body feels as you hear this. And it's great to hear that your mind is intrigued, but let's see what our other senses tell us. Thank you, Brian. Who else would like to share? Enlightened. Whereabouts, Conrad, enlightened? Uh, things like doing what feels good for you is good for everyone else around you. Lots of things. I mean, there's just things like the self-sufficiency principle. It's like it's a really powerful statement that, you know, um, but just something as simple as I now understand <laughs> why making doing the stuff that I want to do makes everyone else not basically cope with, with me, I guess, at the end of the day, put up with me easier. Well, and you bring them joy. And, you know, this yeah. is how sort of play and emotions are intertwined. Because I've discovered that play is a bit like a public service. Because when you are enjoying yourself, it, it's, you know, it's mimetic, it's contagious. People smile in return. And if, you know, I go out for a walk, I make an, I always make it a point to say good morning or hello to every single person I come across. So my husband dreads coming out for family walks. <laughs> Anyway, he thinks I'm a bit mad, but um, I do it because I'm like, this person may not have another person to speak to today. You know, and I do that when I'm on the bike. And I remember once I went around the, this lake at lunchtime and I had no idea why I was really going out apart from, you know, maybe a bit of cardio and just, you know, fitness. And I went around the lake and I said hello to everybody. And as I did it in my mind, I felt like I was reaching back behind me into this bag that I didn't have. And I was literally like throwing confetti because after I kind of rode past everybody, they would leave with a smile when previously they were very stony faced. Now it might just be the, the way their face is made up, but you know, you know how it is when you meet a stranger and they, they look so solemn, but the moment they smile, you're like, oh, hello, Conrad. And there's yep. that connection. And there's this elderly gentleman and he, I didn't have a bell on me and I had no idea how to warn people because it was so quiet and it was COVID. So I cycle, cycle quietly and people would feel like I was sneaking up with them. And when he said, you should get a bell. And then I replied, because I was cycling past, that's a great idea. And as I cycled along, it gave me this idea of actually, if I received that feedback, you know, instead of as a criticism <laughs> of incompetence, I'm not having a bell, but as a gift of feedback, what could I do? And I went, ah, oh, I have the ultimate noisemaker. So now what I do is I just go, ding, ding. <laughs> and everyone just looks around and, you know, they're always quick to, you know, avoid the mad person. They go, ding, ding. And, you know, the children love it. The dogs respond. I'm like, and I've saved a fiver on a bell and I don't have to waste resources on the planet. And this is what I mean. You know, it's like play is a public service and that's kind of what keeps me going. And I see you too, David and Nancy. Um, lovely to have you join us tonight as well. Um, Aaron and Maru, who else would like to just share? Let's do one more. How do you feel right now? Claire, would you like to share? I can get, I'm feeling very, very content and thought, thoughtful. I have lots, lots to think about here, which is really good, making me think, which I like. Hmm. And here's another challenge for you. At the end of this talk, I'd invite you to just not think any more about it. Don't try to retain it. Just kind of go with the flow and just do what feels good. And you'd be amazed by the seeds that have already been planted because you've been listening so intently. Okay, so let's deep dive into some of the more juicy bits. Um, and I rest assured we're going to cover it. So why is this, why is there this disconnect bef between the taboo and the shame and the vulnerability that comes from outward show of emotion? to the one that we know actually helps us think better, um, reduces stress and improves connection between people. Why is there this big gulf? Well, it's down to this, uh, what's known as the classical view of emotions. And this is all great. Um, this is a great book um, by Lisa Feldman Barrett, How Emotions Are Made. And this is really what inspired me to create this talk. And you know, um, all the resources are available, the references in this deck afterwards. So you'd have to make notes. So the classical view of emotions is actually a 2000 year old, we could call it belief, but let's just downgrade that to make it easier to play with, right? A 2000 year old assumption 
It's the assumption that emotions are hardwired from birth. And not only that, not only do you, was there this assumption that you respond to stress the same way your mother or your father does. Yeah. Not only that, but that each emotion has a so-called fingerprint shared by all human beings so that when we are happy, no matter where we are on the globe, we all smile. And when we're sad, we all frown or we might cry when we're upset. And for a long time, these were the assumptions that the researchers went into the field to do their research to the extent they were actually teaching indigenous people these smiley faces that we see now in our texts before doing their research so that they can then say, yes, in, at this tribe, um, when they feel happy, they smile. Yeah, so this is the blind spot about how much we didn't want to look at emotions. Yeah, and that's, look at where it's got us. It's known as um, an essentialist view of emotions, the idea of essence, emotions as essence. And it was supported by, you know, um, very famous, you know, ancestors of ours from humanity, right? From Plato to Hippocrates, Aristotle, and even Buddha himself, right? And this is the thing to remember. I think one of the greatest gifts of science um, and also philosophy has given us is to know that what we thought was the truth and the facts a year ago is likely to be superseded in a year's time when there's more research that will unseat what we thought, you know, was the way the, the world works, right? You only... Um, uh, need to look at the, the latest science discoveries, quantum physics, you know, you try to explain that, right? But it's real. Um, and more recently, uh, people who've been promoting this essentialist view of emotions where it's a fingerprint is Descartes, Freud, and even Darwin himself in the expression of emotions in man and animals. And Darwin said that and each emotion is essentially an essence. So happiness is an essence that gets passed down through our species and it is unchanging, right? And because he got the first bit of evolution right, people assume therefore he was right about every other thing. And I think the key thing here isn't about judging um, our human ancestors for the great work and contribution they've made, but to just acknowledge how much we didn't want to see emotions for as they are that we've made other stuff up to fill that space and this is how intimidated some people felt about emotions so i guess there's neither good news nor bad news there is just news um but here's some that might uh, put a smile on your face perhaps however you like to smile and it's called the theory of constructed emotion by lisa feldman barrett she has discovered that emotions are not built in they are actually made from basic parts, a bit like ingredients that you would have eggs and flour and baking powder and whatever it you mixed in, you could then create uh, scones or a Victoria sponge or something entirely different, right? And that, so this is the thing, emotions are made from basic parts. They vary from culture to culture. They are not triggered. Yeah, we each create our own emotions. And here's one to prove it. So you probably learned how to stop laughing when you got tickled pretty quick as a child, right? You practice. And that's how we don't maybe smile, laugh so much when our children try to tickle us. Yeah, and they can't figure it out because they're like, well, how, how can mommy be tickled and not laugh like a, you know, funny thing? Because it just, I can't do it. And when they discover that you can learn to create, you know, manage that sensation with our emotions, it's like, oh, that's liberation, isn't it? And also we don't recognize, as I said earlier, we don't recognize or identify emotions, we construct them, yeah? So the fact that you are sitting here um, right now at 1800, almost 1900 hours BST um, on a Wednesday evening during a pandemic, you know, your brain's going, let me just check. Um, in my, uh, I was going to say Filofax. Oh goodness, that shows how old I am. <laughs> in my mind's directory, uh, if I've got a memory for that, because if I've got that, I'll just take that emotion stored with that memory that last time, and I'll simply relive it. And that is the point that Frankel was saying between stimulus and response. When you get that file, your brain, you can say, "Oh, hang on a minute. 
there is no such file. I'm going to have to figure out how I really feel about where we are now doing this. And it's about catching yourself. So how emotions are made are essentially the brain creates simulations. I, I love the scientists, you know, it's almost like we invented computer programming in order to teach us more about our humanity. And let's see where that gets us, shall we? Um, but brain uses simulations to basically make sense of information from both outside and inside our bodies. Um, and when we make sense of information within our bodies, it's called a process of interoception. And what the brain does, it's a bit like, um, oh, I've got a visitor. Uh, so the brain constantly predicts how we should act in the present moment, a bit like that, you know. And um, I guess it's a bit like gambling, you know, you need to figure out what the options are, who's going to be the winning horse. I don't gamble, by the way. And what does it mean at this point, you know? Uh, it's a bit like when you open the fridge and you're like, ah. Oh, it's not enough to rustle up dinner tonight. Okay, I know, Deliveroo. You know, it's just kind of catching yourself, knowing you could actually behave differently and the outcomes could be different if you knew there was this, you know, hundredth of a millisecond to change your fate. And the brain basically makes emotions on the spot, you know? And this is such a liberating thing to share with our children because they love making stuff up. They do it all the time, right? They're good at it. So this construction view of emotions then, this modern view, is that it's a combination of um, our bodies, our very flexible brain, which of course wires itself to the environment we find ourselves in, um, both in culture and upbringing, and that includes our family, our homes, and our workplaces. And what's really liberating, I feel, with this construction view, because it's you know, literally like creating your emotions with construction paper is the way <laughs> I see it. It's like a Blue Peter or something, you know, Tony Hart, is that it advocates, right, nurture instead of nature to assume that everything's fixed, like a fingerprint. And um, it also helps you be skeptical and not to swallow everything that people tell you as whole. And most importantly, encourages you to think for yourself which is where we need to be, right? Because there's a lot of stuff out there um, out in the internet, in the world. And um, if we can teach our children and enable ourselves to think and feel independently, to really sense what might be right for us and for the world, then I think we will hopefully um, avoid our own demise. So we're rapidly reaching the end. So the purpose of emotions then is about making meaning from the sensations, right? But not be caught out by this internal storytelling that we always believe ourselves with. And it also actually nudges us towards taking action. And there's this idea as well that um, we have something like an accounting firm in our bodies, that includes our minds, where they kind of constantly checking you know, like an abacus, you know, how much energy have you expended doing that? And, you know, have you got enough energy to do this tonight? And it's called managing your body budget. And that concept is really interesting as well, because we know that, you know, if we don't um, revitalize and restore ourselves, we go into deficit. And nobody wants to be in that place, or certainly in our company when we're in deficit, right? And it also allows us to, you know, the purpose of emotions is connect with each other and comfort each other and also influence the world around us. Now, as I went deeper into this topic, um, inevitably, there, I promised you there would be um, more darkness and sadness and tears, is this concept of um, childhood emotional neglect. It's probably a lesser known form of uh, neglect, but actually it's very prevalent. And it's the absence of emotional awareness in your childhood and home. So childhood emotional neglect is the absence of emotional awareness in your childhood home. Um, and when I came across this concept and this description, I, I said it to my husband, I said, oh, uh, that, that's most of us, isn't it? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think this is the other thing, right? Where is being ashamed and, and, and worried that we are different and we bury ourselves in our caves if we recognize that this is just simply part of the human condition for many of us, you know, that we can connect and support each other. Um, we will realize that this idea of something called alexithymia, it's now a condition that they've diagnosed and it's about a person's um, <clears throat> inability to know how they're feeling. So if you ask um, somebody how they are and they always say good, you know, 
it, this, this lack of uh, broad vocabulary tells you perhaps they may not be very communicative or maybe they don't want to talk to you about it, um, but it may also be an indication that they don't have that breadth of um, awareness of how they actually feel, right? Because you remember um, about the effect of circumplex, even that has, you know, quite a few different emotions um, to describe what tense and stress might be in the, the variables of those. Um, and this childhood emotional neglect is actually highly connected between a parent's attitude towards emotions and the way their children will later deal with it, the emotions themselves. Now imagine when those children who have alexithymia then have parents themselves, you know? And again, this is where the Frankel point about stimulus and response, I'm like, that's okay. I've got a chance here, it's a millionth of a second. And if I'm really present, I can get a few of those in a day. And um, there's a chance, isn't that what got us here today um, as a species? And another um, symptom of this uh, alexithymia it's a very domineering inner critic, that voice that really talks you down from doing things that make your heart sing. Um, that is usually a sign of childhood emotional neglect. And like I said, um, it's more prevalent than we would like to believe. So, well, you know, the good news is we have this construction view of human nature. We can change our stories, um, set aside the beliefs that no longer serve us and maybe adopt more liberating assumptions instead. And the science has proved that we are architects of our own experience and it requires us to take responsibility for ourselves. And um, that was never gonna be easy, is it? Um, and with great power comes great responsibility. And that's what Peter Parker, AKA Spider-Man's uncle reminded him. And I think that's where we can really demonstrate that leadership as adults for children and perhaps follow them because in many ways they are far braver than us. So to finish off then, the ways we can master our emotions, um, loads of different ways, but it comes back to something like you would read in an L magazine or a runner's magazine, which is healthy eating, exercise and sleep. If you wanna buy yourself some fancy exercise kit to get you going, knock yourself out, do what feels good within budget and be sensible, right? Uh, and don't hurt others. Um, just work on becoming more emotional intelligence. And just that actually just means really dropping into your five senses and not just loving this left brain, which came, by the way, your, and the front, your neocortex, that's the latest bit of us that's evolved. Why should that have the seat of who we are when we can embrace our whole selves? Um, and where play comes in is that when we play more, when we do what we love, when we do what rocks our boat, it creates more options for us to then predict how our responses will be and perceive emotions in ways that we couldn't have um, before. So hopefully um, you'll feel inspired to, to share this great news, I feel, with other humans in your life, both big and small. Um, and this, you know, the systemic development, really, I think it's synonymous with spiritual development, right? To be centered, to be at ease, to be, to have a sense of belonging. It's all we're really after at the end of the day. Um, and one of the things that I was playing at with this play index um, uh, with another group, another lovely group uh, recently was as I read out the statements, I was like, oh, this is a, a bit like, um, you know, uh, sort of like a little mantra that you could say yourself, say to yourself. So you could say before you go to bed tonight, may I be fit and healthy? And then maybe it's just a little smile, you know, if you scored yourself low on that, you know. Why not? Just may I be, and that's quite liberty, liberating. You know, may I acknowledge things as they are. May I feel comfortable in my own skin, and may I feel I belong in the world. So I thought, oh, that's nice, isn't it? Value for money, double use uh, out of uh, an invention. So as our as our closing exercise, then let's take a deep breath in. I invite you to recall the challenging step you wanted to take. Knowing what you know now, how do you feel? So let's go around the room, who'd like to share? Knowing what you know now, how do you feel?
I can go. Thank you. So I, I'd say I feel more prepared, more and more aware. More prepared and more aware. And whereabouts aware? I suppose Where? aware in myself, in my mind. Thank you, Ben. I can, I can share as well, by the way. Hi, Portia. Uh, so I think that I'm more, I, I think I know where to start, giving me a bit of a lead on, on where to start. Okay, knowing where to start. And just take a moment, take a deep breath in, Emmanuel. And just try to drop into your body. You know, just, just take that left brain out, put it on the side, it's safe. Just drop in your body. Whereabouts is that knowing where to start in your body? My gut, <laughs> probably. <laughs> and you know, it's so funny. Our gut is an older part of us than the left brain. And yet the left brain runs the show. That's like having your children run your household. Mm. No, nope. that sounds rather <laughs> controversial. But you know, the order of things is important. It's the gut, it's the heart. And then it's the brain. That's how we developed. And when we don't respect our gut and our heart, and there are cells, you know, in the structure that shows that the thinking happens there as well, you know, things go awry. Steve, would you like to share? Uh, you don't have to, it's just you were unmuted. That's okay. Yeah, and no, I feel, yeah, I guess confident more now. And yeah quite focused I guess okay thank you anyone else would like to share of course I was just going to say that you know when I, I said I felt engaged before very engaged mm. it's that it's you know it's okay to pause and be engaged but by engaged means mindful right to take that pause and and then use that for as a stimulus because when you pause and you really listen to what's happening within yourself based on you know the environment that you're in then you listen and then you're you're able to be more creative and so something just throughout this uh, short period of time that we're together is really kind of giving me that enlightenment oh lovely thank you nancy i sense there may be one more is there one more person who'd like to share it's okay if there's more um, my challenge um <laughs> it hasn't changed because it's predicated on the weather. So until the weather changes, I'm pretty level about it. Um, and that my challenge was um, I wanted to start riding again. I have a, a cruiser, a beach cruiser, but I only ride it when it's warm. And it's not quite warm enough to get the legs out yet. So uh, although I want to, I really want to, but it's just not warm enough. And I'm at, I think I'm at even more at peace with that because I went for a walk today in the beautiful sunshine, but it was cold. It was nippy. I had to do my top right up. And so I'm at peace with my decision, I think. <laughs> and you know, the great thing with our brain is that we cannot tell the difference between actual reality of what's happening and a simulation and a memory. So if you were to sit in a chair, I mean, that's what gaming online is, isn't it? Let's face it. <laughs> so if you were to even somehow get your vehicle or get yourself into a setup and just close your eyes and visualize going there, your brain and your body will thank you for it, Brian, because I could feel the joy you had on that buggy, just you describing it, right? Yeah. And that's the gift of our imagination. Anyone else who'd like to share? So just once more with feeling then, crying is one of the body's natural responses for removing pain and toxins. You know, we find the other bits as acceptable. So why should this not be? And you know, you can do it in the comfort of your own home and wherever else you need to, if, if that's needed. Um, the human brain experiences emotions before logic 
and reason. So we are not Vulcan, even though you may wish to be or your parents may wish you to be. Um, we don't recognize or identify emotions. Yeah, we can't tell what someone's feeling just by looking at them. Um, we actually construct our own emotional experiences. So that's why we ask people, how are you today? That's how it started, right? Why else would you ask that if you already judged them and preempted the answer? And of course, we are the architects of our own experience. And so just once more with this self-sufficiency principle, then it's that everyone has everything they need to overcome the challenges they face. And do write to me if you find um, an instance that contradicts this principle, and I'd be delighted to explore it with you. Because I think that's what you know we do, isn't it, as thinkers? We don't want to be right. We want to find out what, what is the truth or what is better or what is simply. So to close then, the success criteria for this evening, I'm going to read through each one. And if you agree, can you raise your hand just so we can kind of like tick it off? So the first one is, I understand how emotions are made. Okay, thanks for the nod, David. I have a greater awareness of my current level of emotional intelligence. Yeah, some of us, great. And it might come to you tonight in a dream, who knows? You know, let's keep an open mind. I have at least two ideas to develop, um, oh, two twice, to develop my emotional intelligence. So I've had at least two ideas to develop my emotional intelligence. Again, that might come to you later. And last but not least, um, I've had fun. Have you had fun? Excellent, thanks, Steve. Okay. So these are the books I'd um, recommend. And uh, should you ever want to come and explore these topics um, and also your relationship with play, you'll find me at um, the schoolofplay.org where we are dedicated to promoting happier adulthood through lifelong play. So thank you so much for playing. Namaste this evening. And it's been a delight to be here and share this talk with you. Thank you. Over to you, Carl. Great, thanks, Portia. Um, do, you, do you have time? For any questions? Does sure. anybody have any questions they want to follow up on? Or just thoughts too. Only that it was really enjoyable, very thought provoking, and um, yeah, re really fantastic. So thanks, Portia. You know, that's why um, I got into the children's yoga teaching because I wanted to bring it to the children. And one of the things you could do, Dan Siegel's work, The Whole Brain Child, um, he, talk, he talks about the chimp. So if you all just take your hand and bend a thumb in and then wrap your fingers around, that's it. Just, it's, it's just a fist and you'd never punch like this because you'd break your thumb, we all know that. But where, we, where I'm going with this, if you stroke this bit of your hand, that's your neocortex. That's the newest bit of your brain. That's possibly where a lot of us may have been seated this evening and it's just where we get paid to think and do our thinking right but if you open it up this bit here your thumb represents your amygdala and it's what dr steve p steve peters calls the chimp and he wrote a book called the chimp paradox um and i use this to explain it to my three-year-old so i said okay uh you know we'd be in john lewis or a shop and she'd be you know mommy i want that toy and i'm like i get it if I were a three-year-old, I want that toy too. It's really good, isn't it? And I said, well, you know, Mr. Amazon, he's not available for the rest of the month now because we spent our budget, but next next month, you know? So you can see she's going to throw herself down on the floor. I'm like, you know, the floor is clean enough. It's safe. So I was like, go ahead. So she goes on the floor and she's, you know, doing a little bit of floundering, not much. And, um, you know, I could feel... <laughs> <laughs> the judgment of the adults around me. But I was like, you know, I'm not going to give up on this learning lesson. That's why I come here. The floor is clean. And um, then she'd stand up as quickly as she got on the floor. She'd take a deep breath in and she goes, thanks, mommy. I said, look, Mr. Amazon, you can look at the budget next, next month, you know, and we can have a longer think about what exactly you want to spend your money on. And I said, by the way, who was in charge just now? Um, and then she'd say, um, Jesse, the name of her chimp, by the way. So we name our chimps, 
Jessie. I said, how are you feeling now? She goes, oh, Jessie's very upset, mummy. I said, oh, I understand, Jessie. But next month, next month, you know, and, and Charlie understands because Charlie's my chimp and that's <laughs> some boys. Sometimes it's a boy chimp and sometimes it's a girl chimp for me. And being able to have that distance you know, literally just recognize that is a remarkable thing. And I do this in meetings, by the way, I'm giving all my secrets away. In a meeting, when you're thinking, oh my goodness, you know, I feel a bit overwhelmed about why I'm in this room. What you can do is actually just stroke your forehead. And what that does is it sends blood flow to your neocortex, which will engage your human instead of your chimp, which is very critical of what's happening, right? And it might be going, WTF, I'm better than being here. But if you do this, it directs blood flow to your neocortex, which means it takes the blood flow away from your chimp and it actually helps calm you down. You know, just really simple little things. If nothing else, you just have a little smile thinking, I can't believe I'm getting away doing this. <laughs> and it's, it's these little tips that get us through the day and you know, share them with your friends because then you can all have a giggle in that meeting, can't you? Um, thank you, Claire. <laughs> Cool. I like that story. And any other questions or thoughts? Okay. Well, thanks, Portia. Sounds I was like we're say, done. Oh, yeah. Dive in there. The, the reason I don't have a question is because I'm working on the first principle. It's just data. Oh, then my job is done. <laughs> love it, love it. Exquisite listening. Nancy would be proud. Well done. Good work, Brian. Good work. Nicely yeah. done. Everybody has everything we need to overcome the challenges we face. So let's remember that when we talk to our colleagues and our family. Cool. We'll have to play again soon. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, that feels like a great time Thank to finish. You, so. Thanks, Portia. Yeah, yeah. Thank well, you. Thanks, Portia. When Thanks, we do Portia. our conferences Thanks, again, Portia. we'll uh, we'll invite you down. All right. Yes, please. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.